Welcome back. Um, we did the grab and grow, uh, go truth today. We did the fatwa on the um, the sheik that was with us in uh, Restoring Courage. We just did some solutions for students, the beginning of that. Now the history of union violence. And I want you to remember that it's communist, socialist, anarchists, along with unions. Remember that. Okay? And then how to stop the unions. Action plan. Let me start here. This tape is from um, the Wall Street protest. Here is the lovely and talented Michael Moore. It has to start somewhere, so it started here. What, what's the goal here, Michael? Right? Okay. Michael, what's the goal well, here? That's anyway? the problem with Wall Street. And it always starts like this, right? You know, at the beginning of any movement. Um, and then it grows. And this one's going to grow very fast because, uh, unlike other movements, uh, you don't have to convince the majority of people that these banks in corporate America has screwed their lives over in a serious way. They already know it. So all we're missing now is just stuff like this. And this will only, this will only grow. Okay. That's absolutely true. He is right. This, uh, it starts like this always, little teeny thing, and it always ends like this. And here's what Hollywood is doing now. Michael Moore stopped by last night. Susan Sarandon stopped by today. It's going to become a Hollywood hangout. It's going, they're going to do everything they can to make this hip and to make it look cool. And it's coming to Los Angeles and San Francisco and then to a neighborhood near you. Now, how do I know that it always ends like this? Well, because this is what inspired them. This is the Watts riots in the 1960s in, um, in Los Angeles. She, Nancy Pelosi says she is afraid of this kind of violence. It's, it's this that she claims is what made her say this comment. I have concerns about some of the language that is, is being used because I saw, I saw this myself um, in the late 70s in San Francisco. Rhetoric was, was very frightening and it gave it created a climate in which we violence took Stop. place and that violence was uh, uh, was caused by the left in the 1960s and in the 1970s as nancy who i think is blinky because they pulled her face back so back to that if the press was honestly looking for violence um, they would look for the common traits of violence who is responsible for the worst violence in american history that's what you would do. If you were honest, you would, you would look for who's always there. One of the things that you would stop at is this report. Uh, American labor violence, it, its causes, character, and outcome. It's from 1969. All I have to read to you is just this. The United States has had the bloodiest and most violent labor history of any industrial nation in the world. Did you know that? Strikers, no matter how violent they might be, would virtually always seek to win the sympathy of the community on their side. That's why Michael Moore is saying, you know what, it's not going to take a lot of people convinced because they know the evil banks. And yet, as we showed you last night, they're the ones who are responsible for a lot of this mess. 1969, that was written, and not a lot has changed. What was it that former SEIU president Andy Stern said? Remember? We're trying to use the power of persuasion. And if that doesn't work, we're going to use the persuasion of power because there are governments and there are opportunities to change laws that affect these companies. We took names. We watched how they voted. We know where they live. We know where they live. Now, that's the kind of record and rhetoric that Nancy Pelosi should be looking for. The history of labor union violence. That's what we're going to do tonight. It goes way back, all the way back to the great railroad strike of 1877. This involved local unions. It was before national organizations even existed. It started in West Virginia and spread to Maryland, Pennsylvania, Illinois, and Missouri. After 45 days, it finally ended when the president sent in federal troops. On May 1st, 1886, union rallies and strikes began in multiple cities, supporting an eight-hour workday. In Chicago, an anarchist founder of the International Working People's Association Wow. 
led 80,000 people down Michigan Avenue. Then May 4th on Haymarket Square, police began to try to disperse another huge crowd. A stick of dynamite was thrown into the group of police. Eight police officers died in the explosion. Gunfire ensued. Four workers died. Sixty other police officers were injured. Eight anarchists and union organizers were charged with being involved. Anarchists and unions, together, then, as now. Then there was the Homestead Strike of 1892, a collective bargaining disagreement between the Association of Iron and Steel Workers, the Carnegie Steel Company. The steel workers went on strike. Carnegie tried to bring non-union workers in. Strikers put up a fight against the replacement workers. So Carnegie called Pinkerton National Defense Agency and defend the workers of the plant. Strikers fired at the first agency's barges, setting them on fire, tore down the fences to storm the plant. After three Pinkerton detectives were shot, the agency fired back. The battle lasted from 4 a.m. to 5 p.m. here in America, 13 hours. It resulted in at least 16 deaths and 60 injuries. An anarchist in support of the union workers then tried to assassinate Carnegie's chairman, but fortunately, wounded, he survived. The National Guard was eventually called in to quell the violence. Let's move to 1905. Members of the militant Western Federation of Miners, the Idaho Democratic governor, kind of went head to head for refusing to meet their demands. In 1922, during a strike at a mine in Illinois, striking workers went into town. They looted a hardware store for guns and ammunition. Then they surrounded the mine where the strike, uh, strike breakers were being protected by armed guards. Three union strikers were killed by gunfire. The next day, surrounded by an armed union mob, the strike bear, uh, breakers sent a guard out to surrender under the condition that their safety would be guaranteed. They were told, come out. We'll let you all get out of the county. They came out. 20 of the 50 were brutally murdered. 1934, streets of Minneapolis. There was an open battle between striking Teamsters Union members who were armed with pipes and the police. 1941, progressive mine workers tried to replace the United Mine Workers again, ended with the killing of two miners in Kentucky. 1976, Jupiter Chemical Company in Louisiana. There was a labor dispute between union workers and an independent contractor which erupted into violence. One person killed, several others injured. There is not enough time on this program, and it's two hours long, to list the entire history of union violence on this program. But remember, if you really want to know what's happening, unions, communist, socialist, and anarchists. Remember the other day we saw at Wall Street there was a sign of the communist and the anarchist, and it was made into one logo, and I said, that doesn't even make sense. For no government. Oh, it does if you know history. It's almost like there's a reason our kids are not taught American history. Because mm -hmm. then you can't see it coming. I'm going to give you one more note, skipping ahead to 1986. It happened at the DuPont Plaza Hotel, where an arson fire killed 97 people and injured 140 more. The fire was set on purpose by three disgruntled hotel employees, all members of local 901 Teamsters. They were in a labor dispute with the owner of the hotel. There have been over 12,000 documented cases of union violence since 1975, but less than 2,000 arrests and 258 convictions have been made because of political power of union. You say that's not possible? How about the beatdown of uh, Kenneth Gladney, SCIU? How about that one? How about, did you ever hear any of these guys going to jail having anything with what they did? biting fingers off and causing all kinds of problems? you see any of it? Of course not. A paltry 3% of union thugs have been convicted of their crimes, and they are just that. They are th thugs. It is silly to think that the unions still have this kind of political clout, isn't it? Yeah, it is. It's as silly as thinking that there are communists still in the United States trying to win. You consider the top two visitors to the White House during the Obama administration. They've been SEIU's Andy CIO's Richard Trumpka. They are thugs. They are the government's henchmen. Trumpka had to say this about his access to the President of the United States and to the White House. Listen. I'm at the White House uh, a couple of times. Okay. Uh, two, three times. And, uh, I have conversations every day with someone in the White House or in the administration. Every day. Every day.
Now we have a story on Richard Trumka that I don't think you've ever heard before. It's coming up next. And if Nancy Pelosi is looking for rhetoric, you really, you should look no further than Richard Trumka. He seems like he has pretty good access. He seems like he has a history of being a thug. And what has Obama said of his relationship with SEIU? Only that they're a great partner. And he can only imagine all the wonderful things they can accomplish together. And of course, after he talks to labor leaders like Andy Stern, former head of SEIU, Richard Trumka admits that he talks to the White House every single day. So basically, SEIU and AFL-CIO rules the United States of America. Maybe that's the reason. Maybe that's the reason why when SEIU Stephen Lerner says all of this. Around the country, people are getting ready and have started moving in to abandoned homes. They're saying, if we don't have decent housing and there's homes that are empty and good, why don't we move into them? So let's think about that. There's, not a, there's a crisis for us and there's not for them. So what do we need to do? What would change their behavior? So, say it again. We have to create a crisis for them. It wasn't his idea. It was the audience. They said it, not him. Barack Obama, he didn't say it. They said it. Nothing. Barack Obama says nothing as anarchists, communists, socialists, and unions occupy Wall Street along with our Hollywood friends. And they escalate the protest, trying to stop the economic heart that powers this nation, as Stephen Lerner urged them to do. Barack Obama still says nothing. He's already said it all. Their agenda, quoting the president, is his agenda. But we can change the course of human events. When we come back, an action plan for those people who are still in a union and they feel trapped. Back in a minute. Isn't it quite that? Yeah. So you, it's hard to tell the story. Yeah. Um, I, um, I want to talk to you now about what to do. What to do. Because that's what this network is going to be all about. Not just the problems, but the solutions. And I want you to meet somebody who has spent his entire career fighting forced unionism. His organization, National Right to Work, documents union violence and provides free legal aid to America's workers. Mark Mix is the president of the National Right to Work. How are you, sir? I'm doing fine, Glenn. Thank you. Um, I, I thank you, by the way, for coming in. I know you were in Orlando this morning when we called, and you immediately hopped on a plane and came to New York, and I, I can't thank you enough for that. Glad to do it. Um, I, I want to go over some of the things that the privileges and the, uh, the plan for people who are, are working um, in unions and don't want their money spent this way and, 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 and what they can do. But I, I also wanted to reach out to you and tell you that what this network is is um, a place that hopefully will lift the arms up of people who have been fighting the battle for a very long time. You've been fighting the battle for a very long time. David Horowitz has been fighting the battle for a very long time. John Hagee has been fighting the battle for a very long time. And find those organizations that are fighting it. And here are the facts. Here's what has to happen. And let people follow their passion. If they feel passionately that the unions are destroying us, great. If they feel passionate about Israel, great. If they feel passionate, whatever the topic is. And I'd like to develop a relationship with you that you feel comfortable with us so you can say, here are the things that are happening that America needs to know, and here's the solution. Because you've been studying it for a very long time. Yeah, and unfortunately, in this case, Glenn, the solution is very, very simple. You know, we have a private organization in this country that has been granted privileges beyond anybody's wildest dreams as it relates to union officials in this country. And I'm not talking about rank-and-file workers. We're not talking about hard-working Americans. There is a growing chasm between America's workers and union officials who yes. have been granted this power. But they all say the same thing. They all will say, because I talk to them. I talk to cops all the time. Guys, your, 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 your uh, union is in bed with the AFL-CIO in California, and they are teaching anti-cop stuff. Your unions are in bed. They'll all say, no, no, that's not my union. No, that's the union leaders, and they're all corrupt, and we know that. How do you convince them that the leadership matters? 
Well, we try awfully hard, and, and certainly using avenues like this and talking about the topic of union violence and the special privilege that union officials have there is one of those things that make people stop and shake and say, that can't be true. Tell me about Richard Trumka, because he has, um, he has kind of a sordid past. Well, indeed he does. As the president of the United Mine Workers Union, one of the most violent unions in the country, Richard Trumka just had complete disdain for workers that were trying to stand up for their own rights. For example, the story of Eddie York. In 1993, Eddie York was on his first day on the job at, a, at the Ruffner Mine in Lenore County, West Virginia. Uh, there was a strike going on at the mine. Eddie York wasn't working at the mine. He was working in cleanup. On his first day of job, he tries to drive home. Gunshots ring out. Eddie York is hit in the head. His truck overturns on the side of the road. Eddie York's dead. While people went to try to provide aid to him, rocks pelted down from union miners. Everyone knew who shot him. Everyone knew it. And yet, Eddie York, his death, his three children, and now his wife are left without a husband. And when Richard Trunk was asked about this in September of uh, 1993, in a Virginia pilot story, he said, if you strike a match and you put your fingers in it, you're likely to get burnt in the context of Eddie York's death. Now, that's the kind of just absolute abuse of privilege that we just can't stand in this country. And believe it or not, Glenn, union officials in the country are exempt from federal prosecution for acts of violence that are used to achieve legitimate union objectives. Excuse me, say that again? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Under a 1973 Supreme Court decision, the U.S. Supreme Court said that union officials were exempt for coordinated campaigns of violence used to achieve legitimate union objectives. That means that if they're out there trying to get a pay raise, if there's a strike... How the hell did that happen? Well, it was a, it was a case coming out of Louisiana. Three guys were using a high-powered rifle shooting out transformers of a utility company. And, uh, you, you know, they went after the union officials because union officials were encouraging them to do these types of things. For example, in 1990, right here in New York, the Detroit, or the Daily News strike, you know, one, uh, uh, a columnist for the Daily News goes to a union hall and he hears a union agent speaking about burning trucks. He says, the, the union agent says, whatever you do, stop the trucks. Don't let them deliver newspapers. And if you want to burn the trucks, go ahead and do it. But remember what the firemen from Brooklyn told us. Leave the doors open because they burn faster. You know, these are the types of attitudes that we have that destruction of property, personal injury, even beatings and bombings and murder are, are just tools how, of the trade. How concerned are you about what's happening in Wall Street? Because SEIU is helping coordinate that thing, and they're doing it all over. Um, and it's anarchist, anarchist, communist. I mean, these guys are not to be trifled with. Well, that's right, and, and they know how to use it. In fact, you know, workers, uh, one, uh, one uh, unnamed union militant was talking in a Washington Post story in 1997. He said, you know, violence is necessary because the people that don't come back are the people that get So, you know, they use violence as a tool to, to Im impose their right. will on America's workers. So show me here, um, uh, the union privileges, these are the things that nobody else has, but the unions have these, right? That's right. And this is the action plan. I want to make sure, Tiffany, make sure we have, now how much time do we have left? Okay, we've got about 10 minutes, so let's go over the, man, that feels good, doesn't it, on television to say we have 10 minutes. <laughs> that's why it's your network. Uh, I know. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, your name's on it. Yeah, right. I know. Uh, the union privileges um, uh, are happening here. Let's go through these quickly, but I want to make sure we get to the action plans. Absolutely. Okay. First and foremost, Glenn, the most important thing, and this is what the, is the predicate for all the things they do, they have a government sanction to have you fired if you don't pay them a monthly union due, a union fee or a union stipend. They can have you fired from a private sector job. They're the only private organization in America with the privilege of forcing you to pay them as a privilege of Vanderbilt working. Vanderbilt University can't even, the Christian club can't even say you have to be a Christian to be a board member of the club. Yeah. But they can fire, have you fired from a private organization if you don't pay them. That's right. In 28 states today, a worker can be fired simply for failing to pay dues or fees. 22 states have right to work laws on the books which protect us from compulsory dues. But this is a federal law that was passed in 1935 during the Roosevelt New Deal era. Mm -hmm. Comes right out of the era that you know so much about and have talked so much about. This power was granted. The federal government took the state's rights to, to manage labor management relations, brought them back to Washington, created a National Labor Relations Board, which you also know a lot about, and gave union officials the privilege of extracting dues as a condition of employment from America's workers. Yeah, I don't know as much about it as Boeing does, <laughs> but if that's not one of the biggest yeah. tragedies, I don't know what is. Yeah. Okay, two. The you exemption from prosecution, we talked about that, the yep. Edmonds decision in 1973. Okay, number three, exemption from anti-monopoly laws. That's correct. The Clayton Antitrust Act, they're 1914, they're exempt from that. So they can go ahead and form cartels and monopolies and stop people from competing with them because they're exempt from antitrust laws. Number four. 
power to force employees to accept unwanted union representation. Absolutely. That's another creation of the 1935 uh, labor law where they say, I can represent you even though you don't want me, didn't ask for me, and don't, don't believe anything that, that I don't believe crazy. anything you want. That's taking away your agency. That's correct. You have no free agency. Evil, America. Evil. When somebody takes away your free agency, it's evil. Call it by its name. Five, unlimited, undisclosed electioneering. That's right. They can use general treasury money to communicate about politics with union members. And now with the new Citizens United case, they can use general treasury money to basically talk about electioneering who must pay it as a condition of their employment. And then they can turn around and use it for causes and political candidates that those very same workers would oppose. Government funding of forced unionism. That's right. This is, a, this is an area where we really don't know the depth of this. But, Glenn, in 1995, when there was a change in Congress, we went in and we examined the Federal Awards Assistance Data Service Act, which is a database created for congressmen to let them know what kind of federal grant money is going to their district so they can take credit for it. We just scratched the surface and we found over a billion dollars in federal tax money that was going to organized labor from places like the Department of Education, the Department of Labor, Health and Human Services, the Department of Housing, and we just scratched the surface. And so the money they collect from workers is fungible. They can use that for all these other things, but the government's sending them over a billion dollars in 1995 oh my gosh. in taxpayer can money. Can you even imagine what that is now? Why can't can we get in and find that now? How do we get um, in? I'm not sure that they, once we bought the database, I think it disappeared. Yeah, uh, we okay. we kind of caught them by, by surprise. All right. Now let me, let me go through the action plan for union workers. This is for people who you may know that is a union worker um, or you are a union worker. You can do these things. That's right. Okay. That's right. Every, every worker in America has the right to resign from the union. The union can't ask you to formally join their union. In a case back in 1961, the Supreme Court, in a moment of bright light, said, you know what? We probably can't force you to be a formal member of a union, but we can make you pay up to 100% of dues to keep your job. So you can't be forced to be a member of the union, but you can still be forced to pay dues or fees. Okay, but if you're paying, if you're giving them money, what difference does it make? Well, that's right. It, but here's the problem with that, is even though, even though if you resign your union membership, then you can't vote in union elections. You can't vote on the contract that governs your terms and conditions of employment. Labor law is stacked against independent-minded workers, and it has been since 1935. So that really isn't a good idea to do. It's not really, but, but if you want to object, in order to get your money back for politics, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a minute, how you get a rebate with. You have to resign your union membership. So on one hand, you have to give up your workplace rights to exercise your political rights. Is there anything to, somebody told me that you can take your union dues and you can pay them to a charitable cause. Yeah. Is that true? Well, it's true, Glenn, and that was a case we litigated on behalf of workers. Our Legal Defense Foundation has set the precedent in that area, but the union has to agree to the charity. You can't give it to a charity of your choosing. They have to. They give you a list and say, these are the acceptable charities. If you want to do that, you've got to give it to a charity that we endorse. That's crazy. How do you do it, America? How do you go to a union job every day? I don't know how you do it. Um, okay, number two, no employee in the U.S. can legally be required to uh, be a full dues-paying formal union member. That's what we just talked Talk about. Talked a little bit about that, yeah. Number three, employees covered by the state right to work laws can't lawfully be required to pay any union fees to keep their jobs. We just That's did that correct. one. And number four, union member who wants to work during a strike should resign from a union membership before going to work. What's that's that? Right. Well, that's very important, Glenn, because union officials can discipline workers who cross picket lines. In fact, we represented some Teamster truck drivers in Chicago who were fined $40,000 apiece for going to work. And so it's very important that one, if, you're, if you want to work, you don't agree what the strike's about. Before you cross a picket line, which is a dangerous thing in and of itself, as we learn from the instance of union violence, you need to resign union membership because then if you don't, you can be subject to internal union, dis union discipline in what is kind of a kangaroo court that finds these workers. We've had nurses from Minnesota find twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 for crossing a picket line. I have to tell you, none of this sounds optimistic. How do you break the back? How, what is the grassroots way for people to organize and break the backs of these guys. Well, let me, let me tell you what's happening here, Glenn. Thanks to you and literally other coming into the popular domain. I mean, the Wisconsin fight back in the early January and March and April, that brought a whole new awareness to people about the power of unions over their government and how the cost of government and the size of government is influenced by union monopoly. The right to work issue is starting to be talked about a lot. In the debate on Tuesday night, the second question was about 
to the Republican candidates would, would you support a national right to work law that would enforce unionism? Things are beginning to happen. As I mentioned, the chasm between rank and file workers in America and union officials is growing wider and wider as union officials get more involved in this crazy stuff like what's going on down the island what, here. Here's what bothers me. They have control of, they're about to organize the Department of Homeland Security. They have the police officers department they have in some of these cities Philadelphia you got to be careful yeah you got to be careful um, and you you have these people who are in these unions who now the unions can make the case because look the politicians have screwed Americans all Americans they've screwed them both sides of the aisle screwed them because they lied to us and and we lied to ourselves we said oh yeah we can we can have it all you can yeah. and they were told because I've talked to a lot of police officers, and I don't know about you, but I see, I see the police officers here in New York, and they're barely making it, some of them. They get all of it at the very end, and then they get their retirement. So they've worked their life to be able to have that end. Now that end is being taken away, and they really feel screwed. Yeah. And they want their money because they lived a hard life the whole time being treated like crap in some of these cities, and they want it. How do you break the message? Because these guys were in with it with the politicians. They knew the upper guys getting all their money. How do you reach out to them and say, no, no, you guys can't, you can't stand with them. You can't stand with these people anymore or the politicians. Yeah. Well, I think as more evidence comes out, Glenn, people will make that decision themselves. But here's the bottom line there. You know, we don't want to stand in the way of any worker joining voluntarily into a union to have their right. views and their, and their desires be voiced. I mean, the right to work organization we believe every worker should have the right to join a union or not but no union. one should be forced to pay yeah. dues or fees look to I have out. to tell you I mean this makes me sound like a you know I'm for these evil giant corporations I'm not oh. there's a lot of corporations that GE is one of them yep. who's not paying their, their, their you want to talk about fair share they're not paying any share also that screw people they just they look at you as expendable capitalism if it is greedy is not good capitalism it's not it's going to destroy us as much as unions are there's always a balance yes but the balance is way out of whack because unions and governments are now colluding that's right that's right and you know and samuel gompers gave us good advice back in the 1920s he said the workers of america adhere to voluntary institutions and anything else is a menace to their rights but yet union officials ran to government in 1935 and said you know what we're getting tired of selling product to america's workers give us government power to force them in and we'll use that to grow our ranks and it's been the death knell of organized labor okay. it's their own fault okay uh, are there um, sure. you to do some uh, some homework and bring um, information that will specifically talk to the police the firemen the teachers and show how look I, I'm for everybody getting what they